Our second scripture reading is from the book of Mark, chapter 13. In those days after the suffering of that time, the sun will become dark and the moon won't give its light. The stars will fall from the sky and the planets and other heavenly bodies will be shaken. Then they will see the human one coming, coming in the clouds with great power and splendor. Then he will send the angels and gather together his chosen people from the four corners of the earth, from the end of the earth to the end of heaven. This too is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Today, as you know, is the beginning of Advent. It's the start of the season of waiting. Two weeks ago, when Jerry and I left on our vacation, which involved a flight from Philadelphia to Las Vegas, we did not realize it was going to be a season of waiting for us. When we arrived at my parents' house, they live by the Philadelphia airport, we had several hours before we needed to check in for our flight. We sat around, shooting the breeze with our feet up, already kind of tired from a long Sunday of worship and then driving. And this was passive waiting. We knew what we were waiting for, and it was just a matter of the time passing until the hour had come to leave for the airport. So when that time had come, we marched ourselves up to the terminal to check in. The kiosk started giving us this weird error message. Those things never work. So we went to talk to a real live person. And while we were talking to a human being, we found out that our flight had already left. Well, we double-checked, and we were two hours early for our flight. We then learned that the airline had rescheduled the flight, and no one told us. Then it was a scramble to find another flight, to make changes with the hotel and our rental company, to talk to the website through which we had booked all of this. And in the end, we found out that we were not able to get another flight out until the next morning. So we were bummed. And we took ourselves out for some greasy food and milkshakes. And we waited until the morning, until we could get on a plane. The next morning, we awoke at the crack of dawn, headed to the airport, and finally got to Vegas at 10 a.m. their time the same day, and we were ready to start our trip. Now, you probably already know this about me, but you may not know it about Jerry. Neither of us are patient people. (laughs) We both come from city (laughs) environments where things happen pretty instantly. We were mentally prepared for our vacation, and even though we knew it was just going to be this epically long Sunday of worship and driving and air travel and more driving, we were ready. And then we found out we had to wait. We did our best to laugh about it, but we were both pretty steamed underneath. Because waiting isn't something that we like to do. Yet today marks a season of waiting. But this waiting is a little bit different. This is not the kind of waiting that's like sitting in an airport, endlessly scrolling through Facebook on your phone, waiting to get on a plane 12 hours after you are already supposed to have left. Advent is waiting with expectation and a little bit of nervous anticipation. So it may seem strange to read a scripture about the end of times at the beginning of Advent. 
Because we want to hear Jesus' birth story. We want to know about the angel coming to Mary and Mary agreeing to be the mother of God. But this passage doesn't give us that. Instead, it tells us about the sun and the moon darkening, the stars falling out of the sky, and this human one, the Messiah, riding in on a cloud to gather the chosen people together. But context. When early Christians, this is the first 100 years or so after Jesus' resurrection, when they were hearing this scripture for the first time, they thought Jesus was coming really soon. They rushed around and rushed to church and did their prayerful things to make sure that they were ready. They wanted to be prepared because, well, who doesn't want to see heaven? And they really thought they didn't have much time. So they interpreted Jesus coming soon in a human way, where soon means much sooner to people than it is when God says soon. And now, 2,000 years later, Jesus is coming soon. Sure doesn't seem like very soon. So we walk around worrying about decorating and shopping and meal preparations and travel plans because history has taught us that we've got time. But what if we don't? We do this Advent thing every year. <clears throat> it's a little newer for us this year because we're new in this space and we have to figure out how to do things for the first time. But we have a good idea of the whole Advent story. We know that Jesus is the ultimate present on Christmas Day. And we have a reasonable idea of how the story goes from there all the way toward Easter. But the people who lived before Jesus, when they had heard that this Messiah is coming, they didn't know when. Experience taught them that it took nine months or so for a baby to be born. But communication was not instant then like it is now. Mary was not posting pictures of her baby bump on Instagram. There was no sonogram for Joseph to post on Facebook. And the media certainly wasn't lurking on their front lawn trying to catch a glimpse of the Holy Family. So chances are that people didn't even get a word about the fact that this Messiah had been born until well after Jesus was the little baby in the manger. So these early Christians spent time actively waiting. They waited with expectation and with nervous anticipation that this thing they heard was going to come into the world would change it forever. And they wanted to be ready for that. And that's the way that we should be waiting for the sun and the moon to stop giving off light, for the stars to fall out of the sky, and for the human one to come riding in on a cloud. Unlike the way we're waiting for Christmas, where we're filling it with the same routine we kind of do every year, we should be waiting for Christ to come again with the expectation that this thing is going to come into the world that's going to change it forever. And we want to be prepared for that as much as we can be. We want to be ready. So, it, look, I get it. The end of times is really scary. 
with all the beasts described in Revelation, the concern about whether or not we're going to end up here or here, how contrary the whole thing can sound to real, actual science, or even the doubt that any of this is even real. You are not alone if you have any of those questions. I'm right there with you. But just as we're preparing for a Christmas celebration, whatever that looks like to you and your household, we also need to prepare for when Christ comes again. No one knows the day or the hour. And that day or hour could be 2,000 years further in the future still, or it could be tomorrow. <coughs> So think of it like a canceled flight. You have no idea when the next plane is leaving, but you want anything, more than anything, to be on that flight. <clears throat> so you are willing to do anything to stand by until you get word that that plane is ready and you can board. Your suitcase is still packed and you're prepared so that when you see signs that a plane might actually take off and get you where you want to go, you're going to be on it. So this is a season of preparation. But we're not just preparing for the coming of the Christ child in that lowly manger stall. We're also preparing for the coming of the Messiah who will ride in on a cloud with great power and splendor and send his angels to the far reaches of the earth to gather up all the people who are heaven bound. <coughs> if that excites you, that's wonderful. If that terrifies you, you are in very good company. And if that gives you a little bit of anxiety, it's time for us to hike up our bootstraps and get to work. <clears throat> because the plane is arriving soon. The Christ child is coming soon. The Messiah is real.